MegCram.com. Welcome to another MegCram video. Today we're going to talk about Hantavirus, and then we're going to do an update on H5N1, and then we're going to see if there's any updates on the Congo mystery disease. Hi, I'm Dr. Roger Schwelt, co-founder of MedCram.com. And whether you're a provider looking for CME credits or a patient wanting to know more about your disease, I encourage you to watch our educational videos at MedCram.com. Let's talk about Hantavirus. This is primarily a virus that lives in the droppings and urine of the deer mouse, but it's also found in other rodents as well. So the world was just mystified by this incident that happened where Gene Hackman and his wife, Betsy Hackman, living pretty much alone in New Mexico, were both found dead in their home and also a pet dog which was found in a crate that was locked in there. First, there was some concern about carbon monoxide, but with further investigation, it was kind of a shock to find out what it looks like happened is that Betsy Hackman died of hantavirus rather rapidly and died at home. Now, this is typically a disease that causes you to have more shortness of breath. This is very similar to COVID-19, pneumonia. It causes a interstitial pneumonitis, which can cause someone to be very short of breath and would normally have them go to the hospital. It's possible, we don't know for sure what was going through her mind, but within 24 to 48 hours of her answering her emails, she was probably already dead. And it's unclear exactly what happened or why, but she was certainly, it looks as though, taking care of Gene Hackman, who was in advanced Alzheimer's disease based on what we're seeing. He may not even known that she would have passed away. It's unclear. This is all sort of speculation, but what we do know, because of the savvy medical examiners who understand the issues there in New Mexico, what it would have looked like on autopsy, which is basically what they found in the lung, when they did testing for hantavirus, they found it to be positive. And the fact that they lived in New Mexico is germane to the topic because if you look at deaths from hantavirus since 1993 until 2018, you can see here a map the two states that had the highest amount of deaths, which totaled 259 deaths in the entire country. You can see here that Colorado and New Mexico are the highest concentration, and that's where we see the virus the most. But clearly, you can see here that most of the Western United States is at risk. I know that where I live in San Bernardino County, we have detected it. I remember back in 2012, there was about 10 confirmed cases of hantavirus, the hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, in Yosemite. And that was at the Signature Tent Cabins in Curry Village. This was linked to deer mice, which were found to be nesting in the walls of those cabins. And there must have been some droppings, which we'll talk about a little bit later about how to deal with that if you ever come across that. But the crazy thing about this virus is that you can be exposed to it one to eight weeks before symptoms come on. So literally, you could be exposed to this virus seven or eight weeks ago and not have symptoms, and then the symptoms come on. It's that insidious. And when the symptoms do come on, fever, muscle aches, fatigue in the thighs, hips, back, and shoulders. The early symptoms are chills, dizziness, headaches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain. Then after about four to 10 days after the onset of symptoms, that's when things go downhill with cough, shortness of breath, low blood pressure, respiratory failure, potential organ failure, and respiratory failure needing intubation. Now, in this case, things seem to move very quickly within one to two days, it appears. And one has to wonder whether or not Betsy felt like she could not leave her husband there. It's pure speculation, and we do not know, but it's a tragic situation. And I would like to raise awareness of this virus so people can understand and be safe so that this doesn't happen to others. So here is a general fact sheet from the National Park Service and the U.S. Department of the Interior that talks about hantavirus. It's important to understand that, what the deer mouse looks like, and that's the one that's usually seen, although it can be other rodents as we've talked about, and how transmission occurs. And they talk about prevention and control here. They talk about avoiding contact, preventing rodents from getting into the building, and how small the holes that they can get into, and how to properly store and dispose of food because these rodents can really smell that out. I found it interesting, by the way, that they said here that sunlight and fresh air will quickly inactivate the virus. So this is typically something that happens when you're in an enclosed space, like a cabin, and very rarely will you be able to catch it outside where there is sunlight. 
This is a great recommendation and report from actually 2002 on this very topic at the CDC titled Hantavirus Pulmonary Syndrome, United States, Updated Recommendations for Risk Reduction. And interestingly, this was discovered in 1993, previously unknown disease. And they even have information here about the cleanup of rodent urine droppings and contaminated surfaces, and the cleanup of dead rodents themselves and rodent nests and disinfecting solutions. The bottom line is don't sweep these things until they have been disinfected and make sure that you are cleaning not only the area and also your gloves before taking them off. And even though it doesn't mention it here, I would definitely wear an N95 mask when dealing with that sort of stuff. I have to say that this story kind of hit home for me. And if there's any virus out there that freaks me out more than any other, it is hantavirus. It's because I live in the mountains in Southern California. I am a pulmonary critical care specialist, so I've seen this sort of stuff happen. I take care of patients on ventilators. There was even one time where I actually came down with a viral illness and had very similar symptoms to hantavirus. I even had the low platelets and elevated liver enzymes that were seen. I was convinced I had hantavirus. I actually went to the emergency room and they found that I had atypical cells. As it turned out, I actually did not have hantavirus. I actually had mono, but it was certainly a trying time for me mentally. This was many years ago and early in my career. I don't know what Betsy Hackman was doing, whether or not she was cleaning up or how she was exposed to hantavirus, but I would just like to caution all of you, if you run into these sorts of things or if you go into a closed space that may have had droppings, think about this before you indiscriminately just start sweeping and vacuuming because it can stir this stuff up and if you inhale it, you can come down with it. Let's move on to H5N1 and this article in the Los Angeles Times. Bird flu infected San Bernardino County dairy cows may have concerning new mutation. I live in San Bernardino County, so this piqued my interest. And as it turns out, this is just the latest dairy cow farm that has been infected, this one here in San Bernardino County. And specifically, what it has is kind of a concerning mutation called the PB2E627K. As it turns out, this was the mutation that was found in the first human case, and also which was extremely pathogenic in ferrets, which in terms of lungs are very similar to human beings. Dr. Yoshihiro Kawaoka, a infectious disease expert at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and the University of Tokyo, in a study that he had done last summer, they actually took this very same strain that he found, and he was able to show that the ferrets were able to transmit the virus to one another via respiratory droplets, and it killed all of the infected animals. Now, interesting, the Texas dairy worker who was exposed to this same mutation didn't have fever or show signs of respiratory dysfunction, but only had conjunctivitis. So apparently it's going to take more than just this mutation to cause pathogenic disease in humans, but it's not exactly a good thing to be seeing this mutation circulating in dairy cows. So if this was going to mean something, what this means is that local hospitals are going to have to be on the lookout for respiratory diseases, especially in workers that are working in the dairy field. Since the outbreak was first reported in dairy cows last March, 70 people have been infected and one person has died. According to the USDA, 985 dairy herds have been infected with 754 of them in California. They say, quote, the key now is for California public health officials and hospital systems to be watching for nasty upper respiratory infections, said John Korsland, a veterinarian and former USDA researcher, especially in dairy workers and their families. And of course, we'll put a link to this news article in the description below. We've talked about the H5N1 flu and how it is spreading across the globe. Now we are seeing evidence of it actually killing birds in Antarctica. This is an article showing that, in fact, it is killing a small amount of birds, but this is the first that they have found. And they say here in the article, between November 2024 and January 2025, Vienna's team of experts from the University of Chile and Santiago surveyed 16 nesting sites of seabirds along the Antarctic Peninsula. The researchers found 35 dead skuas that had no signs of injury. 
Samples from 11 of the 35 bodies were found to be positive for the highly pathogenic H5N1 bird flu virus that has been spreading around the world in recent years. There's some unconformed reports that penguins are also now involved as well. And of course, penguins congregate in very large groups, and so that could actually have a pretty bad effect on that population as well. What are we doing about H5N1 in this country? Other than trying to keep ourselves healthy and avoid getting the H5N1, what are we doing in terms of vaccines and what are their plans? So yes, they do have H5N1 vaccines. However, they are not making them available as yet, except for Finland at this point, which is offering them to high-risk individuals. But rather, places like Canada and the United States are stockpiling these vaccines for a day when they might be needed. And we believe they will probably be targeted to those that are be high-risk in those occupations where they would be more likely to get the virus, like for instance, in dairy cows. The United States is also stockpiling sort of the building blocks of a potential vaccine that might be available later in the future. But the question is, is how effective are these H5N1 vaccines? Remember that this H5N1 pandemic that's going around in birds and in cows and things is mutating. So would these licensed H5N1 vaccines actually still be effective? Well, it turns out there's a study that was just recently published that looked at that very question where they injected one of two of the licensed H5N1 vaccines. And what they found was that it generated cross-reactive binding and cross-neutralizing antibodies against the current clade 2.3.4.4b, which is the dominant type that is spreading right now. And here is the study that was published in Nature Medicine, which we'll put a link to in the description below. This is actually published last year in July of 2024, and they found that there were seroconversion rates of 60 to 95% against this H5 clade 2.3.4.4b. They were observed after two doses of this particular vaccine, and they say that these findings suggest that the stockpiled U.S.-licensed adjuvanted H5N1 vaccines generate cross-neutralizing antibodies against circulating HPA1, H5N1, clay 2.3.4.4b in humans, and may be useful as bridging vaccines until an updated H5N1 vaccine becomes available. Of course, there are other vaccines that are being developed. This one is an mRNA platform, and we talked about that last time. And it showed that it did work at least in ferrets, and there's a link to that study here. Again, we'll post this paper and its link in the description below. There's also a number of trials that are going as well. And we did talk last time about that $590 million contract to Moderna that was made just days before the inauguration from the Department of Health and Human Services. And of course, the question is, is that still on the table? Well, here's a recent STAT article that was published titled HHS Review of a Vaccine Contract Sparks Worries About Preparedness for a Potential Bird Flu Pandemic. And so it is in question. And this review of the contract was first reported by Bloomberg News. It's kind of difficult to see exactly where H5N1 is going to go. It's either going to burn itself out eventually without jumping into humans, or it will jump into humans and continue. And that is a big if. I would say that many of the things that we talked about in terms of our preparation for COVID-19 are also in effect for preparing for H5N1. We've talked about the effect of sunlight. We've talked about the effect of nutrition, of moderate exercise, of the use of hydrotherapy and water in terms of elevating body temperature. We've also talked about getting plenty of rest and sleep and fresh air. So I would highly recommend that you look back at our channel and review those things once again. And finally, we turn to the Congo. The CDC says it is monitoring mysterious deadly disease in the Congo. At least 1,300 people have exhibited symptoms of the mysterious malady, and 53 people have died from the disease as of late February, February 25th. Kind of interesting that these people are dying literally within 24 hours. 
And as we said last time, when they checked for Ebola and other diseases that might have done this, they tested negative. But approximately 50% of the malaria tests that were performed on these cases tested positive. It's unclear whether or not this is a new strain of malaria. For example, they said there was a separate report of an unknown disease in December of last year in the Central African country that was later attributed to an illness from malaria and respiratory illness. So is it possible? It could very well be. The bottom line is right now we do not know exactly what disease this is, but what has made things worse is there are rebels in the area, there is fighting, there's even been an outbreak of mpox again in that area, and so there's a lot of barriers to getting information and testing at this time. Well, I hope this has been informative. Subscribe to our channel, turn on notifications, join us at medcram.com, where we have a number of courses for providers who want CME credit. This one specifically is the ECG, EKG interpretation explained clearly, which is very, very helpful. Thanks for joining us and see you next time.